in Treibo. Adatare Dei. Welcome to Catholic Conversations. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca, and uh, I am joining you today on the Feast of the uh, Holy Rosary. See, the um, October 6th is the Feast of the Holy Rosary, and so today I wanted to talk about the four Marian dogmas, um, and then at a later date I want to talk about uh, the actual rosary Um, and I also want to go in more depth about the, uh, four Marian dogmas and why are they important? Like, what do they mean spiritually to us? What does this have to do with us in a practical sense? But for today, I'm going to be talking about the theology of the four Marian dogmas and, uh, why we believe that these four Marian dogmas are true. Um, so the, the four Marian dogmas are as follows, um, the Theotokos, Mary as the mother of God, uh, the Immaculate Conception, uh, Mary was conceived um, without original sin, the perpetual virginity, that Mary remained a virgin uh, before, during, and after the birth of Jesus, and the assumption of Mary that at the end of her earthly life, she was assumed into heaven. And so these are the four Marian dogmas, and um, I'm going to go through all four of them in detail. Um, and the, the way that they're approaching it, they, I'll go over scripture, I'll go over church fathers. Um, and then I'll go over just logic. Whenever I prove one, I'm going to be assuming that someone, uh, will adhere to the prior Marian dogma, um, because they kind of build on each other a little bit. Um, and the, idea that I'll be setting up here, I will, I may or may not, uh, prove more than once, uh, but we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to start off with the Theotokos. Um, and the reason why, uh, I'm going to start off with the Theotokos, um, and for y'all who don't know, Theotokos means God bearer. So Theo meaning God, Tokos meaning bearer, one who bears God, who gives birth to God. Um, and so Mary as Theotokos is one of the earliest, Marian dogmas that were defined. Um, it was defined at the Council of Ephesus in 431. Um, and I'll just read for me, read to you what it says in the Council of Ephesus, quote, if anyone does not confess that God is truly Emmanuel and that on this account, the Holy Virgin is the mother of God for according to the flesh, she gave birth to the word of God become flesh by birth. Let him be anathema. So what it says here is that uh, that Mary is the mother of God. And this is important because um, if you deny that Mary is the mother of God, you fall into a bunch of different issues um, immediately after uh, denying that Mary is the mother of God. And a lot of uh, Protestants do not do not like the idea that Mary is the mother of God and would like to deny the dogma, dogma of the mother of God of the Theotokos. And the reason why they like to deny it is because they believe that the idea that to say that Mary is the mother of God is turning Mary into a divinity, turning Mary into um, something that she's she's not. So whenever we say Theotokos, we're not saying that Mary uh, created or generated the Holy Trinity. That's impossible. Mary does not pre-exist the Blessed Trinity. That is not what is meant. What is meant by the Theotokos is that that Mary gave birth to Jesus, and Jesus is God. He is the second person of the Trinity. And so if Jesus is God and Mary gave birth to him, therefore Mary is the mother of God. Now this syllogism um, works because uh, the in the and there's a counter syllogism that Protestants like to make, uh, something along the lines of the if uh if mary gave birth mary is the mother of god the trinity is god therefore mary is the mother of the trinity um this does not work and it is a faulty premise and the faulty premise is that um or the it is assuming that whenever our, the um what is it it's assuming the first premise that Mary is the mother of God, that I mean Mary is the mother of Trinity. But I do not mean that Mary is the mother of Trinity. I mean that Mary is the mother of the second person of the Trinity, who is this the Son, who is 
uh, the incarnate word who is Jesus Christ. And so if I was to deny that uh, Mary gave birth to God, then you have to ask, who did Mary give birth to? Um, if you deny the, uh, you'd have to den- deny the divinity of Christ. See, the what uh, a lot of people like to say instead is Christotokos, which is the mother of Christ, that Mary gave birth to the human nature of Jesus, but not the divine nature of Jesus. Um, this is a problem because is, uh, is you, mothers don't give birth to natures. They give birth to persons. And so who was the person that, G, that Mary gave birth to? Is that person uh, the divine word or is he not? Um, then you fall into a lot of the Arian heresies, whether uh, maybe God, Jesus wasn't God at birth, but he became God later. He was, a, he was adopted and you get adoptionism or maybe he wasn't really God. Then you get Arianism. Um, and so you have fallen to all these Christological and, and Trinitarian heresies if you deny that Mary is the mother of God. Another option to get around the Theotokos is to say that she gave birth to the human person of Jesus, but not the divine person of Jesus. Um, and this basically turns Mary, uh, turns Jesus into a, um, into someone who's bipolar practically because, uh, Jesus would then have, have two persons and, um, their wills and their morality is cooperating with one another, but there really are two separate persons. This is, uh, denied by the church and actually would be denied by most Christians, I believe, um, and so the if we believe that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity who has a human nature and a divine nature. And that's what we call hypostasis, where they are together, the hypostasis, they stand together. Um, and so they, the, but he is only one person. And so therefore the person that is given birth to um, is um the divine person. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. And I know I sound like I'm repeating the same thing over and over again, um, but I want to make sure that it's clear of what I mean and what I don't mean. And so to quote scripture, I mean, I mean, that seems pretty self-evident um, to quote scripture. I mean, I guess I could quote the, the nativity scene um, from Matthew, Mark and Luke Um or something along those lines, but I think it's clear enough that Mary was in from the moment of conception, Jesus is the mother. I mean, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity Uh, from the moment of conception. um, It was, there was never a moment when Jesus was not the second person of the Trinity. And if Mary gave birth to Jesus, then Mary is the mother of God. Now I'll quote to you from the church fathers. So Ignatius of Antioch, who was uh, alive in 107 AD he was a um, one. He knew the apostles personally. He said, "Quote: For our God Jesus Christ was, according to the appointment of God, conceived in the womb by Mary of the seed of David. But by the Holy Ghost, he was born and baptized, that by his passion he might purify water." Uh, so we see there that she w- that Jesus is God. So Ignatius of Antioch is saying that Jesus is God, um, and so we all agree on that. And that she, that he was conceived in the womb of, by Mary, um, by the, but by the Holy Ghost. And so we know there that Jesus was God and Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. Therefore, Theotokos. Cyril of Alexandria in 378. I have been amazed that some are utterly in doubt as to whether or not the Holy Virgin is able to be called the mother of God. For if our Lord Jesus Christ is God, how should the Holy Virgin who bore him not be the mother of God? Great question, Cyril. Um, I don't know how you could say that either. So um, that's very easy to say. In Cyril of Alexandria, he's responding to the Nestorian heresy that has popped up, uh, which is denying the the Theotokos and affirming the Christotokos. Um, Irenaeus of Lyons in 177 said, quote, for just as Eve was led astray by the word of an angel so that she fled from God where she had transgressed his words. So did Mary by an angelic communication receive the glad tidings that she should sustain God being obedient to his word. And if the former did disobey God, yet the latter was persuaded to be obedient to God in order that the Virgin Mary might become the patroness of the Virgin Eve. So this is basically saying that in 
in Eve, she rejects God and flees from him and falls into sin. And in him, in her, we have original sin through Mary and her obedience and her fiat and her yes to God and the annunciation, the Mary uh, obeys God and in obeying God, she fulfills or corrects what Eve has lost. Um, and in this way, she is obedient to God and, um, and fulfills that passion, that, um, that duty of, of Eve. And so, uh, the whole idea of Mary as the new Eve is a very important concept that will keep coming back to, um, throughout. And I'll continue with a quote from Irenaeus quote, and thus as the human race fell into bondage to death by means of a virgin, so it is rescued by a virgin virginal disobedience having been balanced in the opposite scale by virginal obedience. Uh, so we see even further a contrast or a um, reflection of Mary as the virgin mother as the, re- reflected against the uh, against Eve. So the uh, and so the yeah, so that that is kind of the idea that I was approaching uh, with the idea of Mary and being the fulfillment of Eve, um, Irenaeus puts it well in saying that in by one virgin, uh, we fall into sin and her disobedience, but by the obedience of another virgin, um, we have the salvation of mankind through the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, but Mary could not be this person that is rescuing us if it was not the fact that she gave birth to God, gave birth to Jesus Christ. Now, the idea of Theotokos, like the actual term Theotokos, was used very early, even in terms of prayers and liturgies. Um, In fact, the earliest prayer that we find um, that's to Mary is found around 250 AD, um, though some scholars believe that it could be a actual copy of an even earlier prayer, um, though the this piece of paper that we found it was dated at AD 250. It's a Coptic Catholic prayer called the Subtuum, and it, and it says, quote, Under your mercy, we take refuge, Theotokos. Do not reject our supplication in, nece- in necessity, but deliver us from danger. O you alone, pure and alone blessed. Uh, so there we see a early, early use of uh, three very important things. One, that people are praying to Mary. Two, that Mary is referred to as a Theotokos, as the God bearer, as the mother of God. And three, that they're asking her to deliver them from danger. Um, and that she is calling them pure and blessed. Uh, so they are, there are many other um, church fathers that talk about Theotokos, but I think that this uh, will suffice for the proof of um, Mary as Theotokos. I think that is a, a decent um way to, to end that first dogma. Um, though there is one other thing that I thought of just now is that, um, that Jesus is the, is from the line of David, right? He has to be from the line of David because if he's not from the line of David, he is, um, he would not be the Messiah. So the genealogy in Luke, um, is the genealogy of Mary and Mary can trace her lineage back to King David. But the uh, lineage goes through the male in terms of like inheritance and the the fact that Mary is betrothed to Joseph betrothal is not like engagement betrothal is actually you're married already, but you have not yet consummated your marriage. Um, And so the fact that Mary is betrothed to David to um, to Joseph means that Jesus would inherit that um that lineage of mary because mary can trace it back to david and so mary must be the mother of god in order that mary be fulfill that uh, that jesus fulfill the prophecy that he would be the messiah would be from the line of david so once you give the point that mary's mother of god it's much much easier to address the rest of the dogmas including um, well, this is not a dogma, but this is just a teaching of the church 
um, which we see in prayer and liturgy um, and so on and so forth, but that Mary is queen of heaven and earth. And the reason why it's easier to see that is because you look at what, what it means for someone to be the mother of a king. And so if Jesus is the king of heaven and earth, and I think we all agree that Jesus is the king of heaven and earth, who is the queen of heaven and earth? Well, you might say, why does there need to be a queen of heaven and earth? Well, I'm not saying that there needs to be. I'm just saying that it's fitting that there is. And the reason why it's fitting is because the um, the kingdom of heaven is a reflection of the kingdom of David uh, because it's a fulfillment of it. Uh, so the kingdom of David had a queen and that queen was not the wives of David because David had many wives. So did Solomon, but instead the queen of the house of David was the mother of the king. And so you see in Solomon that, that Bathsheba is the queen of uh, the nation. And so uh, in the same way, Jesus, his mother would be the queen of his kingdom. So the, that is the um, idea of Mary as queen of heaven and earth because he, she is the mother of Jesus and therefore um, is the queen mother, just as we see in the, uh, the social kingship of D- David and Solomon. Uh, so that, that is a whole topic on its own, and perhaps one day I can spend time and talk about it. I know I promise so many different topics. If you know what you want me to talk about, email me at fontecaproduction at gmail.com. So that way I know what you want to hear topics about and I can um, do those things that you want to hear about. Anyways, I'm going on to the Immaculate Conception. Now, the Immaculate Conception was defined around 1854. It was defined by Pope Pius IX. Um, I don't mean around 1854. It was defined in 1854 by Pope Pius IX. He uh, gave an infallible statement um, that is binding on all Christians and all Catholics to believe in the Immaculate Conception. And I'll read you from his document what he said, quote, Accordingly, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for the honor of the holy and undivided Trinity, for the glory and adornment of the Virgin Mother of God, for the exaltation of the Catholic faith, and for the furtherance of the Catholic religion, by the authority of Jesus Christ our Lord, of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own, we declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary is the first instant of her conception, in her first instant of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God, and therefore to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful." Hence, if any one shall dare, which God forbid, to think otherwise than as has been defined by us, let him know and understand that he is condemned by his own judgment, and that he has suffered shipwreck in the faith, that he has separated from the unity of the church, and that furthermore, by his own action, he incurs the penalties established by law, if he should, uh, if he should err to express in words or writing or by any outward means the errors he thinks in his heart. So we see there the clarity in which Pius the Ninth has, has um, explained the dogma of the church and the fact that um, how binding it is on Catholics. And so the that is a dogma of the faith and must be held by all Catholics. Um, the Immaculate Conception. The and then his entire document, he talks about how uh, what he means by the Immaculate Conception and why he's saying it. And um, he kind of says the gives some proofs of it. Um, and I won't be giving his proofs. I'll be giving other proofs instead. But um, I'll just go through some of them right now. So in the uh, in Luke chapter one, verse 28, it says, and he came to her and said, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Uh, the word grace that is used in the in Luke in Greek is, um, and I'm going to pronounce this terribly, um, is kekatomine, uh, which is the Greek word for full of grace. It is actually the, the perfect passive participle for the meaning of full of grace. 
And um, what it, what the heck is a perfect passive participle? A perfect passive participle, say that ten times fast, um, is a um, is a participle which is takes place in the past and is continuing on um, now. And so, by saying that Mary is full of grace, uh, full of grace, it is saying that Mary was graced and continues in grace. Um, and so, this idea is the is the um idea that mary is uh immaculately conceived because at the we're saying it in the past um in a in a indistinct uh defined past mary was given grace and so that grace that overflowing grace which we refer that's why we say um in latin we refer to it we translate it as gratia plena because it's the grace that is overflowing it is like full of grace. It is not just um, a lot of grace or some grace. It's overflowing grace. Um, and so the and then so to go back to talking about Eve. So um, Mary is the fulfillment of Eve. Now, um, some people might say, like, why does there need to be a fulfillment of Eve? Um, I mean, I guess technically speaking, there doesn't need to be a fulfillment of Eve, but it's fitting that God would have a uh, fulfillment of Eve, um, someone that would reflect her and have it to its fullness. Um, so just like Adam is the prototype of Jesus. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of Adam. Uh, Mary is the fulfillment of Eve because the, uh, we see that there has to be a person that's going to, to complete what, or to, uh, to make right what Eve has wronged. And so Mary, as the new Eve, has to be greater than Eve. And the reason for this is that the uh, type is always greater than the uh, thing that it is reflecting. For instance, Jesus is greater than Adam. Jesus is greater than David. Uh, The waters of baptism are greater than the waters of the flood or the waters that are part of the Red Sea. The manna from heaven is uh, not as great as Jesus, who is the bread of life. Uh, We see that all these Old Testament types that are fulfilled in the new are always better in the new. And so Mary is the new Eve must be better than Eve. Now, this cannot be true if Mary has contracted original sin. Um, So therefore, Mary must be free from original sin. Because if she did was not free from original sin, she could not be the type of Eve. She could not fulfill the um, the belief that Eve or the uh, she could not fulfill uh, and be the greater Eve and be the new Eve if she had and at some point in the past had been um, stained with original sin or. If she in the future or in some of the present time, she has contracted a sin because then she would be just as bad as Eve. And so Mary is immaculately conceived and then continues without sin. Um, and then the, another type of uh, that Mary is, is the Ark of the Covenant. You see that Mary is the fulfillment of the Ark of the Covenant because uh, what is the Ark of the Covenant? See, the Ark of the Covenant was a golden box. And in that golden box, it ha- it what did it house it housed three things the rod of Aaron the high priest the uh, manna that fell from heaven and it housed the um, ten commandments and so these things were symbols of God and the Jews believed that the dwelling place of God was the Ark of the Covenant and they would take the Ark of the Covenant into battle and with the Ark of the Covenant they would never lose a battle because it housed the dwelling place of God. It was a dwelling place of God. In fact, it was so important that the Ark of the Covenant be um, so pure that it was made of solid gold and that nobody was allowed to touch it. In fact, whenever someone did touch it because the Ark was falling and someone went to catch it, uh, that person who tried to catch it was killed instantly by God. And so the, the Ark of the Covenant has to be immaculate, has to be perfect, cannot be defiled. And the um, and so Mary being a fulfillment of that Ark of the Covenant, because in her womb, because she is the Theotokos, uh, in her womb, she housed the, the uh, fulfillment of the high priest, who is Jesus, the fulfillment of the manna from heaven, 
who is the bread of life, who is Jesus, the fulfillment of the, of the law, who is Jesus. And so she is the new Ark of the Covenant. And we see in Revelations uh, chapter 11, verse 19 through chapter 12, verse 2, um, that the that the book of Revelation talks about the new Ark of the Covenant. So I'll, I'll show you, quote, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, voices and, pearl, and pearls of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail, and a great portent opened in heaven, appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child. So we see that in the in verse nineteen, there was uh, the heavens open up, and the ark of the covenant is seen. Uh, for the Jewish audience, they would be freaking out because the ark of the covenant was lost. Um, it was taken away in Second Maccabees. We see that the Ark of the Covenant is hidden away before the Babylonian exile and is never found. And so the um in the and so the they are have it lost until a cloud of um uh, the Spirit of God reveals where it is hidden. So the to this day we the Ark of the Covenant has never been found. And the and so in Revelation, whenever it says the Ark of the Covenant appeared. The Jewish audience would freak out and be like, oh my gosh, where where is the Ark of the Covenant? Tell us where it is. But then at the very next verse, we see the woman clothed with the sun who is with child. Well, to a Jewish audience, they're going to be like, um, can you get back to the whole like Ark of the Covenant thing? Uh, but to the Christian audience who is reading this, we'll see the parallel that the Ark of the Covenant within his temple, that that is reflected and fulfilled by the woman clothed with a son that is with child. Uh, and the the reason why that they're in two different chapters, because you see when the book of Revelation was written, there was no division in chapter and verse. And so uh, whenever chapter 11, verse 19, the very next verse is chapter 12, verse 1, and then verse 2. So if you take away the chapters and verse numbers, they're right next to each other and they go, they flow into each other. See the chapter and verse numbers were added hundreds of years later. Um, but the, I, the written down, uh, it's simply put there in order for us to better organize our thoughts and quote things and things like that. Um, and then from, um, and then to address a common objection against the immaculate conception, uh, see, it is common for people to claim that Thomas Aquinas uh, denied the Immaculate Conception and that Thomas Aquinas did not believe in the Immaculate Conception. And this is not true, but true, but not true. Um, so in one way, he he did deny the Immaculate Conception, but it is important to note that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception as we know it today was not defined during the time of Thomas Aquinas. And in the way he def denied the Immaculate Conception was very particular, and I'll show you. But I want to just trace you into the theology of, of Thomas Aquinas on the topic from the beginning of his um, education to the end of his life. You see, when Thomas Aquinas was um, first a theologian, he was commenting on the sentences of Peter Lombard. And the sentences of Peter Lombard is like basically the typical um, assignment that uh, people who were studying theology had to do before they could pursue anything else. And so his first assignment was the commentaries on Peter Lombard. And in his commentaries, um, he, the, um, he says, quote, such was the purity of the blessed Virgin Mary, who was exempt from both original and actual sin. So you see at the very beginning of his education, he actually did uh, subscribe to the Immaculate Conception that Mary was both free from original sin and actual sin. But later on in his Summa Theologiae, he's very, very, very clear that he believes that Mary did contract original sin. He says, quote, the Blessed Virgin did contract original sin. So he denied the, the Immaculate Conception. He later goes on to explain what he means by Mary contracted original sin. He believed, um, and later of his Dominican brothers would explain what he meant by this. Um, he meant that at the moment of Mary's conception, a moment passed 
and in the womb, whilst after her conception, uh, maybe like a second after or two seconds after, immediately after her conception, she was then cleansed of original sin. Uh, so the idea was the, what he was trying to do was trying to understand how Mary can be both immaculately conceived and still saved by the by the uh, sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so he came up with this idea where she is conceived and then immediately after her conception, she is saved by Jesus Christ and cleansed of original sin. Um, and then, but uh, later on in a sermon uh, on the topic of the Virgin Mary, he actually kind of goes back uh, for a third time on the Immaculate Conception. And he says, quote, for she, the Blessed Virgin Mary, was most pure because she incurred the stain neither of original sin nor of mortal sin, nor of venial sin. Um, and so we see that Thomas Aquinas's idea on the Immaculate Conception, he was trying to figure out uh, what exactly he, uh, what exactly the proper formulation of this dogma, but he definitely adhered that she was sinless. He just was trying to figure out the details of how it works. And so this wasn't solemnly defined until much, much later. Um, and we end up using Dun Scotus's idea of the Immaculate Conception, where he says that Mary was preserved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. She was preserved from ever having incurred original sin. So um, I believe, and other uh, Dominican theologians also believe, that if Thomas would have lived longer and have been able to correct his Summa Theologiae, he would have gone back and fixed this error that he made in his Summa um, because Thomas actually died before he ever finished his Summa. He was uh, towards the end of it um, when he died. But the sermon that he wrote that I quoted from a second ago uh, is dated at the latter half of the Summa, whereas his commentary where he writes about the Immaculate Conception happens much earlier. Um because he was also working on sermons and things like that later on. And so it is commonly believed that he would have reneged on that. Not to mention the fact that Thomas always said that if anything he says was wrong, he submits the authority of the church on the topic. So we know that Thomas would have adhered to the Immaculate Conception. Um, to quote the church fathers, uh, Hippolytus in 235 says, Quote, he was the ark formed of incorruptible wood, he being Jesus, for by this is signified that his tabernacle was exempt from perturbity and corruption. Uh, this means that his tabernacle, what is his tabernacle? Where does Jesus reside? Jesus resided in his mother. And so his mother was exempt from all corruption. Then from Origen in 244, he says, quote, This virgin mother of the only begotten of God is called Mary, worthy of God, immaculate of the immaculate, one of the one. Now, what does the word immaculate mean? Um, from It comes from Latin, and what it means is free from stain or without stain, because immacula is um, a stain. And so immacula is without stain. And so if you have a macula, you have a stain on your shirt or you something like that. A immacula is free from all stain. So she's free from the stain of original sin. She's immaculate of immaculate, one of the one. Uh, St. Athanasius in 373 says, quote, O noble virgin, truly you are greater than any other greatness. For who is your equal in greatness? O dwelling place of God, the word. To whom among all creatures shall I compare you, O Virgin? You are the greater. You are greater than them all, O Covenant, clothed with purity instead of gold. You are the Ark in which is found the golden vessel containing the true manna, that is the flesh in which divinity resides. So we see from Saint Athanasius in three seventy three that he is already talking about that Mary as the Ark of the Covenant, and that in her. She contained the true manna, that is Jesus Christ, the flesh um, that we are to eat. Now, Augustine in 415, he says, quote, we must, ex uh, we must exempt the Holy Virgin Mary concerning whom I wish to raise no question when it touches the subject of sins out of honor to the Lord 
for from him we know that uh, we know what abundance of grace for overcoming sin in every particular was conferred upon her who had the merit to conceive and bear him who undoubtedly had no sin. Uh, so it is just said from Augustine, basically what he's saying here is that we know for sure that Jesus had no sin. Jesus had no sin whatsoever. It would be a uh, blasphemy to say otherwise. And I believe every Christian would agree with me, would agree with me that Jesus had no sin. Um, but then Augustine is saying something further. He's saying that it is from the abundance grace for her that she also be exempt from sin. Uh, so that the uh, I think that will suffice for the talking about the um, talking about the idea of the immaculate conception. I think that will be where we will. Um, I think that is uh, suffice for the immaculate conception. I think I'll move on to the perpetual virginity of Mary. Now, the perpetual virginity of Mary actually predates the dogma of the immaculate conception. See, the perpetual virginity of Mary was a dog uh, was declared a dogma and the Lateran Council in 649. And let me read to you what it says in uh, the Lateran Council. Quote, if anyone does not properly and truly confess in accord with the Holy Fathers that the Holy Mother of God and ever virgin and immaculate Mary is the earliest of the ages in the earliest of ages conceived of the Holy Spirit without seed, namely God, the word himself, specifically and truly who was born of God the Father before all ages, and that she incorruptibly bore him, her virginity remaining indestructible even after his birth, let him be condemned. And so the perpetual virginity of Mary is declaring that Mary um, remained a virgin both before the birth of Jesus, during the birth of Jesus, and after the birth of Jesus. Um and so the church fathers talk about how uh, in reference to uh, during the birth of Jesus, that Mary, because she was free from original sin, and this is why I went over Immaculate Conception first, um, because she was free of original sin, she is able to, um, she does not incur the punishments that are due to original sin. See, we see in Genesis that the original sin of Adam and Eve is what caused the pain of a childbirth. And therefore, since Mary did not have original sin, nor mortal, nor venial sin, she did not have the pains of childbirth. Instead, the church fathers talk about the that Mary's birth is like um, light through glass, that Mary, that Jesus just passed through her womb. This is often um, compared to how Jesus would pass through the tomb after his resurrection or how he got into the upper room um, during the, after his resurrection. Uh, so there, we're not saying that there is a clear understanding of how he does it, just that he did do it. Um, and so the common objection to the perpetual virginity of Mary is not about uh, her virginity before Jesus. It is usually the about after Jesus. They typically say that the, that Mary had other kids in the common um, passage that they like to use um, to claim that Mary had other kids is from Matthew chapter 13, verse 53 through 57. It says, quote, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he passed from thence and coming into his own country, he taught them in their synagogues so that they wondered and said, how can, how came this man by this wisdom and miracles? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Jude and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence therefore hath all he all hath he all these things? And they were scandalized in his regard. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Uh, so this is the uh, common passage. And the reason why is this part here where it says it is is, is not in an is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Jude? Uh, so the that's the common objection saying that these are clearly listed, the brothers of Jesus. And so therefore it must be that um, Mary had other kids. So the I don't want to uh, dive too much into um, the Greek in regards to the brothers of Jesus. I just want to make something uh, clear that I think everyone can agree upon. See, the word for brothers here 
is a word that can also mean cousins. And all scholars agree that the word for brothers in Greek um, does not necessarily mean that we, uh, it is a, a bloodline brother. He is a brother of the same mother. And so in the same way that I can call a friend, yo, bro, or hey, brother, um, or anything like that, or I say any, any number of things. I call uh, friends of mine that I've had for the past 10 years, I'd be like, I would be like, yo, bro, or oh, yeah, that's my brother. Um, or even you see he jokes in uh, movies and things like that. I don't think anybody actually says this anymore. I've never heard it. But people might say, uh, my brother from another mother, um, that kind of thing. That idea is the same idea that I'm trying to get out here and say that just because it says the word brother does not necessarily mean that we mean the same type of brother. So I won't quibble here because there is also another Greek word that can mean um, a, a relative who is not one's brother. And so... Uh, and the people would often ask, why didn't they use that word instead, if that's what they meant? Uh, so I just want to leave it at this and simply say that the text does not require uh, belief that Jesus had biological siblings. So the um, and so I'll just leave it at that and then use other proofs to try to prove that these are not the brothers of Jesus, the biological brothers of Jesus. So the because I think we can agree on what I've said so far. Um so a, another thing that people often say is that Mary says um, that Mary did not have kids until Jesus. Uh, but the word until does not imply that she necessarily did have other kids. So, for example, uh, my professor at the University of St. Thomas, he often says, um, and this is a belief we, we teach until today. Um, and so he would talk about that in regards to all sorts of things. He'll say, we believe in X, Y, and Z until today. Um, and the, whenever he uses that, he doesn't mean that now today we no longer believe this. He means that, um, until today and then onward into the future, because, um, my professor English is not his first language, nor second language, nor third language. Um, he speaks like nine languages. And so, when he says until, he means a ongoing until. And, it, and that's the same kind of until that we see in scripture. That just because it says that Jesus will reign until the end of the world does not mean that Jesus will stop reigning at the end of the world. And so we see, we know that the word until does not necessitate that it ends. So um, we can believe that Mary is a, a perpetual virgin uh, while still holding that she was that the, using the word until. Um Another thing is that Mary is often believed in from a lot of scholars, both Protestant, atheists, and Catholic alike, that Mary, um, whenever she says that I know not man in Luke, she is not saying that um, she does not know man yet. She's saying that she is a virgin uh, perpetually, that she has consecrated herself. She's a consecrated virgin. Um, and so that idea um, that she's a consecrated virgin, she, whenever she asked the angel, so how can this be for, I know not man is a question of not that, um, that she's not doubting that God can do it. She's just asking, well, how is this supposed to happen? Um, and if she, uh, did not know if she was not a perpetual virgin and not a consecrated virgin, she would have no need to ask, how can this be? Because she would just assume that she would bear a biological son with her spouse, who is Joseph. Um, because you, as I said before, that the betrothal did not necessitate, did not mean that they're engaged. It meant they were already married and that they only need to consummate. And so the, if that, uh, the angel has, was simply telling her that she was, um, going to conceive a child, she would have automatically assumed that it was going to be a biological child with Joseph and had no need to ask, how can it be? Um, how would it happen? And so the and so the idea here is that Mary uh, was a perpetual virgin because she was a consecrated virgin. And in this situation, she was trying to figure out um, how God wanted her to have a child. And so she was asking God what to do and what would happen. And then God tells her the power of God from on high would overshadow her. Um, and we see uh, that as a fulfillment of the Ark of the Covenant, because the Ark of the Covenant was hidden, we see in 2 Maccabees, until 
the um, spirit of God revealed it. And the spirit of God over uh, came over it. And so the spirit of God came over Mary and she is the new Ark of the Covenant. And so that is revealed. She's the new Ark of the Covenant. Um, and then finally, I want to give you an argument from Matthew itself about the um, idea of, uh, well, actually, I'll take that back. I want to go to the argument from Matthew's last. Uh, so the argument from John, um, the beloved disciple, you see the entrustment to John at the foot of the cross where Jesus turns to the, God, the apostle John and says, behold, your mother. This is important to note because um, if Jesus had other siblings, it would go to his siblings that they would take care of Mary. It would not go to John to take care of his to take care of his mother. But it is assumed that Jesus did not have siblings, and therefore, and Jesus gave his mother to John in order that he take care of her, because in Jewish culture and really in all cultures up until modern era. If a woman was a widow, if a woman was a widow, she did not have any property. She couldn't get a job. She would have nothing, no one to sustain her. And she'd basically just be a beggar um, and or die. So the in that moment, it is assumed that there is no other person to take care of Mary. Because if he had other siblings, it would fall onto the next eldest son to take care of the uh, take care of the Virgin Mary. So, um, and then finally, I want to talk about the argument from Matthew. So Matthew in chapter 27 verses 55 through 56 and 60 through 61 says, quote, and there were there many women far, uh, far off who had followed Jesus from Galilee ministering unto him among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee and laid it in his own <clears throat> and laid it in his own new monument, which he had hewed out in a rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the mount monument and went his way. And there was the, and was there Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. So we see that at the foot of the cross, there is both Mary Magdalene, uh, the Ma- Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the uh, mother of the sons of Zebedee. So, and then at the uh, tomb, there is Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And so I don't think um, that the other Mary can be the mother of Jesus. And the reason I don't think this is because the mother of Jesus is given so much um, importance and the, and to just say, oh yeah, the other Mary, Mary wouldn't be referred to as the other Mary. So we assume that the other Mary must be the mother of James and Joseph who is a distinct person from the mother of um, Jesus. And so we see from earlier, whenever it is said um, that in um, chapter 13, verse 53 through 57, that the, that the brothers of Jesus are James and Joseph and Simon and Jude. What we see here that James and Joseph are um, actually from a different Mary. So, uh, and, and then we look at the gospel of John in chapter 19, verse 25, it says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And so we know that the, um, that Mary has a sister who is a Mary, who is Mary of Clopas. Now, Mary of Clopas, um, we don't believe is actually Mary's biological sister either. We believe it's probably her cousin because it'd be kind of weird for, um, St. Joachim and Anne, the mother of uh, Mary, to have two women, two little girls named and named both of them Mary. That'd be kind of odd. Um, And so it is typically believed that Mary of Clophis is actually the the Mary that is referred to in Matthew, who is the mother of James and Joseph, who are cousins to um, Mary. And uh, some scholars believe that the it is since it if it's if it's her sister, which I mean, if it doesn't matter if it is, if it is her biological sister, then James and Joseph are her cousins and not biological brothers. But if it's her cousin, it's even further removed and um, maybe like second cousins to Jesus. Now, sacred tradition actually holds that it actually might be the uh, sister in law of uh, Mary because uh, in the church fathers um, in the church history of Eusebius that was published around 300 to 400, it says, quote, 
after James the Just suffered martyrdom for the same reason as the Lord, Simeon, his cousin, the son of Clopas, was appointed bishop, whom they all proposed because he was another cousin of the Lord. And then later on, he talks about how uh, Clopas is actually the brother of Joseph. Now, if it's the brother of Joseph, now we have an interesting thing there because that means that the um, that Mary, um, Mary of Clopas is only related to the Virgin Mary um, through St. Joseph and therefore is her sister-in-law. And so this means that Joseph, I mean, that um, these people that are referenced as his brothers, as Jesus's brothers are actually not by uh, blood related at all. Um, it also shows that in the early church um, that we know who these people are, that they, and that the church uh, history by Eusebius, who wasn't trying to prove the, um, the immaculate, the perpetual virginity. He's just trying to recount church history. He says that James the just uh, suffered martyrdom. Uh, Simeon was a cousin of, of, uh, of Jesus and he was appointed a bishop. Um, so that is very important. So we see that it is that it is not bounding to believe that it's his biological brothers. In fact, it would be wrong to believe that it's his biological brothers and is very clear that it is his cousins. So um, to make an, a different argument um, and not go to the church fathers, I want to go to someone that I actually disagree with. I'm going to go with the Protestant reformers. You see, the Protestant reformers all agreed in Mary's perpetual virginity. I'm going to start with John Calvin and then go to Luther, Zwingli, so on and so forth. These aren't the only Protestants that agreed, but these are the most prominent. And I'm just going to read their quotes and just continue through it. Um, and if I find something that I think needs to be explained, I'll explain it. So, quote, the word brothers, this is from John Calvin. The word brothers we have form, formally mentioned is employed agreeably to the Hebrew idiom to denote any relatives whatsoever. And accordingly, Helvidius displays excessive ignorance in concluding that Mary must have had many sons because Christ's brothers are sometimes mentioned. Uh, Helvidius is a guy who was denying Mary's uh, perpetual virginity and said that the brothers are his biological brothers and that Mary, there were Mary's sons. Um, anyways, I'll continue quote. This passage afforded the pretext for great disturbances, which were introduced into the church at a former period by Helvidius. The interference he drew from it was that Mary remained a virgin no longer than till her first birth. And that afterwards she had other children by her husband. Jerome, on the other hand, earnestly and copiously defended Mary's perpetual virginity. Let us rest satisfied with this, and no just and well-grounded inter- uh, inference can be drawn from these words of the evangelist as to what took place after the birth of Christ. He is called firstborn, but it is for the sole purpose of informing us that he was born of the virgin. It is said that Joseph knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. But this is limited to that very. But this is limited to that very time. What took place afterwards, the historians does not inform us. Such is well known to have been uh, the practice of the inspired writers. So we see that John Calvin affirmed the immaculate, the uh, perpetual virginity. Now to go to Martin Luther. Martin Luther says, "Quote: When Matthew says that Joseph did not know Mary carnally until she had brought forth her son, it does not follow that he knew her subsequently." So this is to say, just because it says that Joseph did not know her until she brought forth Jesus, it does not mean that afterwards he did have sex with her. Um, continuing on, quote, on the contrary, it means that he never did know her. This babble is without justification. He has neither noticed nor paid attention, any attention to either scripture or the common idiom that Jesus was born a Jew. Christ our Savior was the real and natural fruit of Mary's virginal womb. This was without the cooperation of a man, and she remained a virgin after that. Christ was the only son of Mary, and the Virgin Mary bore no children beside him. I am inclined to agree with those who declare that brothers really mean cousins here, for holy writ and the Jews always call cousins brothers. And this was from um, the sermons on John from Martin Luther. And then from uh, Zwingli, Zwingli says, quote, 
I firmly believe that Mary, according to the words of the gospel as a pure virgin, brought forth for us the Son of God, and in childbirth and after childbirth, forever remained a pure and intact virgin. I believe that he, Jesus, was made man, joining the human nature with the divine in one person, being conceived by the singular operation of the Holy Ghost and born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who, as well after, as before she brought him forth, continued a pure and unspotted virgin. Um, and that's from his letters to a Roman Catholic. So the so Zwingli um, also believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh, so does John Wesley and many other Protestant um, theologians and reformers, quote, quote, quote unquote. Um, so I will conclude with a quote from Thomas Aquinas on the perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, so the so I just so I can end on a Catholic note in regards to the perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, and I just wanted to quote them because I know a lot of Protestants that um, deny the perpetual virginity, but like all the founders of Protestant denominations all agree with the perpetual virginity of Mary. But anyway, I will quote from you Thomas Aquinas and I'll just read through what he says. And this is from the Summa Theologia, um, the terse pars, the third part, question 28, uh, article three. Without any hesitation, we must abhor the error of Helvidius, who dared to assert that Christ's mother after his birth was carnally known by Joseph and bore other children. For in the first place, this is derogatory to Christ's perfection. For as he is in his Godhead, the only begotten of the Father, being thus his Son in every respect perfect, so it was becoming that he should be the only begotten Son of his mother, as being her perfect offspring. Secondly, this error is an insult to the Holy Ghost, whose shrine was the virginal womb, wherein he had formed the flesh of Christ. Wherefore, it was unbecoming that it should be desecrated by intercourse with man. Thirdly, this is derogatory to the dignity and holiness of God's mother, for thus she would seem to be most ungrateful, were she not content with such a son." And were she of her own accord by carnal intercourse to forfeit that virginity, which had been miraculously preserved in her. Fourthly, it would be tantamount to an imp imputation of extremely pres of extreme presumption in Joseph to assume that he attempted to violate her whom by the angel's revelation he knew to have conceived by the Holy Ghost. We must therefore simply assert that the mother of God as she was a virgin in conceiving him and a virgin in giving him birth, did she remain a virgin ever afterwards? So Thomas is very clear and very eloquent in his uh, explanation of the perpetual virginity of Mary. And I think I'll leave it at that and move on to the last Marian dogma. I know this has been a long one, especially for me. Um, I'm exhausted. Um, my throat is like, ugh, dead. But we are almost done. The last one is the Assumption of Mary. Um, this was declared, this is probably the most, this is the most recent Marian dogma, which was declared by Pius XII on November 1st, 1950, in his document, Munfici, uh, so I'm going to totally butcher this pronunciation, um, Munificitissimus Deus, something like that. Um, and so let me read to you what the, uh, what his dogma says. Quote, for which reason, after we have poured forth prayers of supplication again and again to God and have invoked the light of the spirit of truth for the glory of almighty God, who has lavished his special affection upon the Virgin Mary for the honor of her son, the immortal king of the ages and the victor over sin and death for the increase of the glory of that same August mother um, for and for the joy and exaltation of the entire church by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ of the blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and by our own authority, we pronounce, declare, and define it to be a divinely revealed dogma that the immaculate mother of God, the ever Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. Hence, if anyone, which God forbid, should dare willfully to deny or to call into doubt that which we have defined, let him know that he has fallen away completely from the divine Catholic faith. So 
essentially it's actually interesting to look at and say that the she in this dogma that he is affirming here he actually reaffirms all the old dogmas he says the immaculate mother of god so right there he says that she's immaculately conceived immaculate without stain the mother of god theotokos that's two of them and the ever virgin mary that's three that's a perpetual virginity and then finally was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory it's all four dogmas uh right there in one sentence um so okay the assumption of mary is the i think the hardest to prove on its own in the sense that the assumption of mary is not clearly anywhere in scripture um but it is a very um obvious um continuation of the other three marian dogmas which is why i'm including it last you see that if mary is the mother of god she is immaculately conceived, did not have original sin, and never had mortal sin or venial sin, and therefore does not have the punishments of original sin. And she remained, uh, was an ever virgin, and so she um, was a consecrated woman of God. Um, therefore, it is fitting and right that she be assumed into heaven, because the wages of sin is death, and she did not have sin. Um, but then, okay, you have the question of, did Mary die? And there are um, debates on whether Mary died. I originally was in the camp that believed that Mary did not die, that it was most fitting that Mary did not die because uh, she did not sin. I was uh, later convinced that she did die. Um, and but you it is not binding on anyone to believe one or the other. Uh, I'll tell you my theory, um, which I am uh, adopting from the Greek Orthodox tradition um, and a lot of other Mariologists that I know. But the idea that Mary is um, did not die, I will give you the fact that she did not die first and then I'll move to what I believe now. Uh, the idea that Mary did not die, I believe that because uh, Mary was sinless and if she was sinless, she does not deserve death. And that ma- that Jesus, loving his mother so much, um, would not want his mother to suffer death. Um, and because that we see in the Old Testament that both Enoch and Elijah were assumed into heaven without dying, it would be unfitting that the mother of God die um, when uh, Enoch and Elijah did not um, did not die. And so, therefore. If, if Mary was to be greater than Enoch and Elijah, she must not die as well. Um, and so that's the argument of why I think she did not die. Now, the right reason why I think now that she did die is because in the Greek Orthodox tradition, which is dates back to very, very soon after um, Christ, um, in the few, like, the few hundred years after the death of Jesus and the death of Mary, um, and most people uh, quibble about the death of Mary of when that was. Um, some will say, I think um, AD 63 is a date that Dr. Taylor Marshall adheres to. And um, I'd like his explanation of why he thinks AD 63 is right. So I'll just say AD 63 for now. And um, if someone has a better dating, let me know. Uh, but that's the best one I've heard so far. So the um, the Greek Orthodox tradition is that Mary died and then three days later, uh, she was uh, assumed into heaven. And uh, the Franciscan tradition is that the, the Mary, at the end of her earthly life, Jesus appeared to her and asked her uh, if she would like to go home, go up to heaven, um, body and soul right now, or would she rather die and then be assumed into heaven? And Mary said she would like to be like him in all things. And so she would like to suffer um, separation from her body and soul. And so, um, just like Jesus, who did not deserve death and um, did not have original sin, did not have any mortal or venial sin, just like Jesus had to suffer death, Mary too suffered death. And so this is what um, really convinced me, is the idea that Mary would desire to die in order to be like her son in all things. So that's what really convinced me that she did die. Um, and so then and Mary was assumed into heaven. This idea that Mary's assumption into heaven um, is present um, because of the in Revelation. And so that's probably the only 
one of the only places that people look at as a idea that Mary was assumed to heaven because the woman clothed with the sun that this is the vision of John is um, the idea there is that it happened. This uh, revelation happened after Mary's uh, assumption and Mary's assumption happened. And then the revelation happened and he saw the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And so that idea is that he saw her in her heavenly glory. So therefore she was assumed into heaven. Now, the uh, if you accept that Mary is the mother of God and that Mary is immaculately conceived, then it is clear that Mary must have been assumed into heaven. Now, most of the traces of um, the assumption of Mary is actually found in apocryphal writings throughout the first centuries. And so the... Um, I don't want to go through those and quote them because uh, they are varying different circumstances and some of them aren't as clear as others. But it is what is good about all the Apocrypha, because there's a lot of them that all talk about the Assumption of Mary, is that the um, it is clear that, that it is a common tradition that people actually believed that Mary was assumed into heaven. And that no uh, church father spoke out against it. So it definitely wasn't something that was popping up and people and the church fathers were like, oh, that's bad. Um, But I also don't want to quote it because it's not um, binding on Catholics. Those apocrypha writings, um, those apocrypha writings are also uh, not believed to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, And the church fathers don't quote those uh, apocrypha. And so I won't quote them here. Uh, but I think it's just important to know that they are, the idea of the assumption has was around throughout the first centuries. Um, and so the ultimately, I think the the best proof for the assumption of Mary is the idea of Mary as a fulfillment of Eve um, as the and the one that has no original sin, because the uh, in that it'd be more fitting that she be assumed into heaven because both Enoch and Elijah were assumed into heaven. So it's not like where I'm saying something that is completely unprecedented as um, in Elijah and Enoch, I think all Protestants would agree were assumed into heaven. And um, if those two would be assumed into heaven um, by the power of God, why would he not assume his mother into heaven? Um, and then the reason why that this is a dogma is because that the belief is, is that the apostles, all of them, um, except for James, were actually present at the Dormition of Mary. Um, the Dormition of Mary is what the uh, Greek tradition calls the um, the Assumption of Mary. He, they refer to her falling asleep and then being assumed into heaven. They don't like to use the word die um, because die connotates the idea of the sin Uh, the punishment due to sin. So they say the dormition, the falling asleep. And so the, all the apostles were present at the assumption according to tradition. And so the idea that she, it's an, it's part of the apostolic faith therefore. So um, I think that will conclude um, the ideas of the Marian dogmas. If you want me to go more in depth about the assumption um, I can, if y'all would like me to, I'm going to recommend a few books and videos that you can uh, watch or read um, if you want to talk about the Marian dogmas and the typology related to the new Eve, the new Ark of the Covenant, and that kind of thing, the best book on the topic, I think, is Brant Petrie's book, um, The Jewish Roots of Mary. Um, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary, I think it's what it's called. Um, and then if you want to go on to like a systematic idea, um, theology of the Marian dogmas, I think the best book for that one is... Um, Behold Your Mother by Tim Staples uh, from Catholic Answers Press. Um, in regards to devotion to Mary, obviously true devotion to Mary is the best thing you can have. Uh, I recommend you go and actually read the documents that uh, were declared because in the documents, they explain why they declare these um, these dogmas. So Pope Pius XII, just look up Pope Pius XII, The Assumption of Mary, and it'll pop up and you can read it. Um, and the same thing for Pope Pius IX, may type in... Um, Pope Pius the ninth and the Immaculate Conception, um, and you will find it in his defense of the Immaculate Conception. I think those two are really good places to look as well. Um, in regards to other the other videos, I'm thinking of um, the any just type in Brant Petrie and uh, Mary, and you'll find a bunch of things um, that I think were really helpful. And uh, 
the Dr. Tara Marshall has multiple videos on the Assumption of Mary. I think he has like three or four. Um, and he has his video on the dating of the Assumption of Mary. And that that's the one I, I really like the best as terms of um, finding a good date for the Assumption of Mary. And uh, I think that would be the it. Oh, another good book on the idea. So um, Fulton Sheen has a book called The um, the World's First Love. And basically he argues um, for the Marian dogmas. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say he argues for the Marian dogma specifically because he doesn't. But what he does do is um, take you through and uh, explain who Mary is in relation to salvation and in relation to Jesus and what that means for us and what that means for her and what that means um, for the, and what, and what, how that plays out. So I think that those books are a good places to start and different places to go. If you um, are more interested in one thing versus another, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can email me at Fonseca production at gmail.com. That's Fonseca F O N S E C A production at gmail.com. Uh, for any questions, comments, or concerns, soapboxes, negativities, or positivities, or anything in between. Um, and uh, yeah, my voice is kaput. That was a lot of talking. Um, and please let me know if you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Send me questions, comments, concerns, and anything else that you have, uh, suggestions about other video topics, anything like that. Um, and I will close out with a Hail Mary, as always, especially on this Feast of the uh, Holy Rosary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tuum mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Juventus, Amen.